Do you want to learn the tricks that top leaders use to get the most out of themselves and their teams? Well, Naftali Hoff is here to help. Lead to succeed. Picks the brains of top leaders to learn about their challenges, insights, and best practices. Here's Naftali. Hello, Lead to Succeed Nation. It's Naftali Hoff, and welcome to Lead to Succeed, episode 136. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Jeff Baldessari. Jeff is a former C-suite executive and the author of From Associate to Ambassador. It contains the skills and disciplines that are not taught in law school, but are needed to build an extraordinary career. This book speaks to law students, summer associates, and young associates who aspire to achieve extraordinary outcomes in their careers. Jeff, I'm so glad to have you on the show today. Good morning, Nepali. I love to be here. Looking forward to it. I love all the distinctions you're making in the field of leadership. Uh, oh, and in those okay. Distinctions, that's, that's where all the well, gold is. When you get well, that's things. where that that's yeah, that's where we're going to have to unpack today. So, thank you for being with me, and let's let's dive into it. Um, let's talk about your book because I know you have a long I know you have a long leadership career, but since you just wrote this book, I'm not exactly sure when it came out, but it seems to be more recent. And certainly it's something that is very interesting to me because my first book, which is called Becoming the New Boss, uh, was also written for people who are just getting into, in my case, getting into leadership. So you're talking about people who are in, specifically in the law space, but I'm curious to know what motivated you to write this book. You know, you must have had something in your background or something that you've, you've, you've observed that made you feel like this would be a valuable contribution to the marketplace. Yeah, that's a great question. And in the poly, it for me, it wasn't. It actually was written. The original manuscript was written thirty years ago. No, and that said, I read a book. I, I was at a national law firm, Baker Hostetler, a young, you know, junior associate, and I wanted to become a corner office partner. And so I started observing what set them apart from everybody else, and how what traits, skills, you know. Uh, you know, philosophies, values that they possess that enabled them to reach that that pinnacle um, of their career. And I started creating the observations, writing them down. And all of a sudden, I aggregated and accumulated quite a bit of information. And it wasn't where they went to law school. It wasn't their field of practice, but it was essentially they, they possessed and mastered timeless uh, foundational values and principles. And after I had accumulated all this, then I then took it and thought, I'm going to create a book out of this. And I put something together, added some quotations. Of course, I did this pre-internet. This was 1993. When the internet existed, but it wasn't a real research tool that it is today. And uh, if you can imagine writing, sending your manuscript on a floppy disk and, and mm, putting it in. I the remember US those day. days. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I remember Waiting those days. three or four weeks to get an answer. And I did that. And there's a couple of publishers that wanted to publish it. W.C. Wiley was one, but I didn't like the format they wanted to use. So I put the manuscript in a box and it sat there for 30 years until last summer. Wow. And then I engaged in a rewrite and uh, decided, uh, having spoken to someone who was writing a book, and uh, I decided I'm going to get this back out there. And, and it wasn't so much so to publish the book. So the book was published and came out and launched uh, the beginning of January, January 8th. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, but my goal in this process is to help those those junior associates, those law students, you know, accelerate their professional development and create more career fulfillment. Because in the practice of law, if you're at an AMLAW 200 firm, the, the competition is extremely fierce. And if all you are in today's world is a subject matter subject matter expert, you're vulnerable. And uh, this is to, to take you beyond just becoming a partner, is to, is to, to create that uh, value and, and you'll have more career fulfillment, you'll have more job security, if you will, you have more control of your own destiny. And the interesting thing about what I learned, it all boiled down to people, directly and indirectly. It's your relationship, it's, it's the four things, it's your ability to manage, motivate, inspire, or influence people, those four things. And uh, either it's a direct correlation that I put in the book, the things that I observed and saw that others mastered, or indirectly, you're impacting one of those four buckets uh, with respect to people. So that's how it came about. And again, it was just something I wanted to be when I grew up. And, uh, yeah. and yet 80% of my book could apply to any industry. It is not yeah. just for the law industry. So it's uh, mm -hmm. things you need to do. And if you look at the people that are most successful uh, in leadership roles, it's because they've mastered these foundational principles with, with again, 
managing, motivating, inspiring, and influencing people. Okay. So I, I do want to un unpack that. And I love the fact that you feel that your book is is largely helpful to people of all of all walks of life, so to speak. And we can go there as well, because I could say something similar about my book. Um, but I do want to take a step back for a moment and talk about the fact that you had this manuscript, you began your process, obviously it was an earlier stage, so maybe you had less access to to publishers or to to agents that you might have today where, and you can even self-publish today, which I don't think was really readily available back in the day. But I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know um, what advice would you give to people who have a meaningful idea? You know, obviously sometimes we have ideas that are maybe underdeveloped or we think it's a great idea, but it isn't such a great idea. And they have this flash of inspiration that comes and it goes. That happens too. But there are people, many people, who have expertise, who have experiences, and they really should collect, organize, and present that information to a broader audience, not only to help them with recurring revenue and becoming more of a thought leader, but of course, to help others by reading it and being inspired by it and taking action around it. So my question to you is, what advice would you give to somebody who is maybe, maybe thinking about putting out a book at some point, or maybe feels that they have some some really great content to share, but is lacking the information, the the directive, the the confidence uh, to to go further with it, um, to help them actually bring it to to an audience and see the light of day. I, I would take the approach that that I've taken, I've learned over my career that I do with networking, where you start you know, expand, having different conversations, people from different, uh, wa you know, wa walks of life, as you, as you described, or different industries, because when you start having conversations and, and you can do a formal approach, but I want, I want to engage in this, like appreciative inquiry where you have different voices brought to the table, because when people see things through a different lens, they're going to have different commentary or they're going to bring up something. Well, I never looked at it that way. So by having, going through one's network and, and chatting, like, do you know a guy, do you know a gal? It, it, it's been in these shoes and, you know, and, and what did they experience? And you can learn, you know, success leaves clues. So does failure. Um, and if you can mimic where those, and by having these conversations, it gives you the opportunity to mimic those that have been successful, those that have reached the, desire, the desired outcome that, that someone is, is seeking. Like even in my own case, the book that I originally wrote in 93 uh, is different than what's published now from from associate to ambassador. In fact, the title's even changed. I changed the name of the title, and it's more of a workbook today than it was back in 90, uh, 93. Because a workbook to me, I wanted this to resonate. And if you don't engage a reader in my particular case, if it just becomes a passive endeavor, and this is, you know, this is, I mean, the book's nearly 200 pages long, 190 some pages long. So it's got dozens upon dozens of, of, of pieces of advice. And what I learned by talking to the development editors that I retained um, to help me in this journey and to, to, to produce a better book when I did the rewrite is I wanted it to be an active uh, activity with the reader, between myself and the reader, even though I'm not physically in the room with them. But if I ask them to take the moment to take to learn some action steps and go out and do it or to reflect, they're going to learn more. It's going to re be re more retained than just passively reading page after page. Because in my case, the, this book is about embedding behaviors, values, principles, skills into your DNA, into your daily life, and sharing, this is what I want, the outcome I want to re reach. Ideas are going to come out, and um, it's going to be a better conversation, and somewhere between you and whoever you're speaking to, and multiple people, not just one or two, you're going to end up in a better place and uh, and have a better outcome and, and, and reach that goal that you're trying to do. Okay, well, that's that's very powerful. And I'm, I want to go back now to what you talked about before. And I think that what you shared may be not very intuitive to a lot of people. Because I think a lot of folks think that the most important thing is the technical knowledge. So for example, my background is in education. So you think that the best thing I could do to become a better educator and eventually school leader is to be really good at things like curriculum and delivery of content. You know, those are classroom management, things like that. And obviously you need those. But in the case of leadership in particular, what I learned 
is that much of what I needed to do as a principal was nothing, had nothing to do with my knowledge of how to run an effective classroom. It was more about how to manage people and how to get the very best out of them. It was a shift from me to we, so to speak, as I often refer to it. And a lot of people, I think, let's say in the law, in the law profession as well, tend to think about, well, I want to be the very best lawyer. I want to understand the law to the best of my ability. I certainly want to be able to deliver uh, the best outcomes for my clients, et cetera. And so we don't think much. In fact, you might even stereotype and say most lawyers are in certain types of personalities where people skills are not their, their strengths or certainly not their focus. Minimally that I would say. So when you're coming to aspiring lawyers, aspiring associates, and you're telling them, hey, slow down, you know, yes, get your get your legal stuff in order, but you really want to develop in these other areas. Uh, number one, how do you how do you make that argument in a way that people will listen to you? Because again, it's counterintuitive for many people. And number two, why do you think it really is that important? I know you talked about differentiating. You're dealing with a lot of smart people, but talk us through that a little further, please. If you limit your your career to yourself, you've just limited your 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 the amount of abundance that you can bring to the table. If you engage other people, there's number there's there's strength in numbers. I don't care what it is. And I think well, let's let me address the first point that you brought up. And this is again what's in my book that it really became apparent to me to be successful in the practice of law or to be successful in any industry. You know, to your point. You're not taught this in law school. What, what's in my book is not taught in law school, yet it's the most important thing. They don't teach people skills in law school. They don't teach you how to, you know, again, to manage, motivate, you know, inspire and influence people in law school. When I, I was an accounting major in undergrad, I passed the CPA. And, in, and as a business major, I went to a very good business school, a great, great program. But they didn't do a, that much of a job on teaching you how to write written communication. So if you can connect with people, you've now those numbers and strength. If you surround yourself with great people, you can go much farther in life than in your career than just being a subject matter expert. Yes, law school tends to, and business school does the same thing, forces you or causes you to get to into this narrow funnel, becoming a subject matter expert, whether it's accounting, it's finance, it's it's you know labor law, it's uh, litigation. Uh, it's transactional work, whatever that the topic may be. And if you limit yourself to that, you're limiting yourself to the audience that you can reach, the customer base you can reach, the client base you can reach. But then if you surround yourself with great people, they can lift you up. They can make you look like a genius. They can also make you look like an idiot too, if you, if you don't surround yourself you know, with the right people. Um, but that's that's why it's so important. Otherwise, you know, it's just like comparing a sole proprietor to a Fortune 500 company. It's the it's 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 about scaling the the abundance that you can create around you, the insight, and also diversity is so important because with diversity you're going to get different perspectives and different thought processes, and that makes you a better professional, and it brings that enables you to bring more value to the table when speaking to clients. So that's that's the other thing. So that's why I would say it's so important with people. And like you said, that that is that is the ball game, is people, yeah. period. I don't care yeah. what you do for a living. And that's how you yeah. can scale your business is by connecting with people. Right, and people wanna work with you more if they, they're gonna have their choice. You know, they often say on the airlines, we, you know, we know you had your choice of airlines and we're thanking you, we thank you for choosing United or whatever. Right. So it's really the same concept. You know, lawyers are not, I don't want to suggest anyone's a dime a dozen, but there are many lawyers out there, as there are many coaches and many other industries. And so people have their choices, especially today, where I can jump on a Zoom call from wherever, you know, anywhere in the world. I'm going to be more selective than ever before. And so developing those those skills, I think, are critical because not only do you have that ability to amplify, like you talked about, and multiply your business through through good people, but you then become a differentiator. People want to work with you. They want to, you know, who wants to work with somebody who's who's all about themselves and 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 not a pleasant to be around when I can find somebody who has the requisite skill set plus is a pleasure, kind, considerate, et cetera. Cause we always remember how people make us feel. And I think that's really important. And right. it's just a shame, um, Jeff, that uh that whether it's because I will tell you from my my background in education, it's the same thing. 
right? I, I didn't get from, I, I have two master's degrees in education. I have a doctorate in human organizational psychology. Nowhere along the along that did anyone, as far as I can recall, ever spend meaningful time talking about developing the soft skills, the people skills, and, and, and amplifying their importance. Not just saying, here's how to do it, but here's why it's so significant. And if I could have the ear of every dean of law schools throughout the country, throughout the world, as well as the deans of schools of education and any other industry specific business, you know, to emphasize to them that you really need to be spending some time on this. You really need to be telling your people how important these are. And, and besides for things like how to market yourself, how to identify a brand, there's a lot of that too, like business development. It's a whole different conversation. And I feel like the schools are so, so focused on the technical elements of doing the work, they forget that these people can't just show up and hang a shingle and say, hire me, I'm a great accountant, or hire me, I got all my law you know, credentials, I'm ready to roll. That's not going to cut it, right? The relationships matter, the marketing and the branding matters, all those back-end things matter. And so we're doing, I think, our graduates a tremendous disservice by not giving them more of that holistic picture of what they need to succeed in the 21st century. And maybe maybe the reason again I'm, I'm obviously speculating here is typically that the subject matter experts, the professors in law school, and then ultimately they 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 spawn you know the the new generation of attorneys or prof business professionals doesn't matter what again what the industry is, they tend to be introverts, and they love to stay in their little nest, the little world of becoming all things, whatever the topic may be. And it's comforting. And you don't have to, it's, it's a relationship between you and a computer, you and a book. It's not you and people. And so to go to develop people skills, it's getting outside your comfort zone. And maybe that's the reason there's the hesitancy, you know, historically, that in, in the curriculum or the law school, because everybody seems, to, you know, the most successful business people figure this out. Later, the most successful lawyers figure this out later. That's how, you know, someone becomes a rainmaker. You know, you, you can't just be like you just said, if you're a subject matter expert and that's all you are, you're a commodity. It, it's not disrespectful. It's a fact. There are dime a dozen. There's a bunch of super smart people in this area. But if you don't connect with people, you don't build that bridge of trust. You may not be the number one expert in something. You might be number five. You might be number yeah. 205. But if you build trust, you're number one. Right. And because so because you look around. Yeah. To your point, Jeff, if you look around and you see how come that lawyer is, is killing it and I'm not, and I'm a better lawyer than he is. And I had this conversation with myself as an educator, as a coach, right? There are other coaches out there doing far better than I am financially. And it's not necessarily because they're better coaches, but they've learned how to market themselves better. They've learned how to have great conversations with people. And those are all skills I had to learn. The day I decided that I'm going to hang a shingle and say, here I am, I'm now benighting myself as a coach, um, as opposed to an educator and everybody go hire me. It, that wasn't what happened. What happened was I started to, to, to market myself. I started to reach out to people and to have proper conversations. And, and thankfully I continue to reap the benefits of those and, and continue to have them because I know that that first and foremost is my entry point into the opportunity to, to work with people. Yes, I still have to demonstrate capacity. And yes, I still get a lot of referrals. Uh, people will refer me constantly and I'll, you know, I'll think that my next opportunity is here and then um, it shows up over there. Uh, and oftentimes because of referrals, which is fantastic. And that's what I live for. But if you don't develop your skill set, especially if you're aspiring into leadership, you don't really stand a chance, I don't think you know, in today's marketplace. So I know we, we could continue to talk about this further, but I would love to pivot. And um, I, I do want to get into, you know, you talk about an extraordinary career, right? Helping associates have that. What, what would you say if you had to distill that down into either a vision or core components, what would you say, looking back, somebody would say, I, this is my career. And as a result, it was extraordinary. I made a difference in people's lives. That's what it boils down. I've made a difference in my colleagues' lives. I've lifted them up. I've lifted my support staff up. I brought out the best in people around me. I've lifted, I've made a positive impact on my clients because that's fulfilling. 
And if you can create the environment for others to thrive in, that's what it all boils down to as a leader, uh, as a, you know, whether you're an attorney, whether you're a business person, it doesn't matter. Um, that's to me, that's what makes the difference. And, and I think that's the most rewarding feeling in the world um, that you did make a difference and people are grateful for the difference you made. Uh, it's not that you won the million dollar you know, judgment against somebody um, or, you know, it's, it's not about dollars and cents. It, it, you, you said it earlier, people remember how you make them feel. And, but you feel great when you see others express gratitude that you made an impact on their life for the better. And uh, that to me is, is the number one thing. It's more than I was the smartest guy or gal in the world on such and such a topic. Who cares? You're going to be gone. And guess what? All that brain power is going to go with you. But when you make a difference in other people's lives, now you're creating a legacy. Now there's something that's going to go beyond. It's bigger than you and it lives beyond you. Uh, it's your reputation. So that's what I think is the most fulfilling. Okay. So I'm going to push back a little bit, not because I disagree with you at all, but just because, for example, I run mastermind groups and I've got busy, busy business owners that I see as much as they are well-intentioned, don't do certain things that they know and I know will help them grow their businesses. Um, and I'm not going to get into the specifics there because that's not so much the point. Let's use an example that we're talking about over here. You've got a young associate. I still want to make myself, I want to make myself shine, right? So I want to work hard and and do get my briefs in or do whatever it is that I need to do that's going to demonstrate capacity. And I'm super busy with that. And here you are, Jeff, and you're telling me that I've got to spend all this extra time. I see it as extra, right? All this time now working on nurturing relationships and, and improving my, my interactions and all these kinds of things. What is your advice to help people who feel like this is a burden and feel like this is an added responsibility and I've got enough on my plate as it is? How do you get them to make the shift to say, you know what? It's really that important, and I must do this um, if I'm going to if I'm going to taste success. Even if at some point it might diminish my overall output or some other technical base metric. Well, I disagree that it's extra work. You know, it's not. It's become a role model. Be be the demonstrate to others. There's a better way to do things. There's a, it could be more efficient. Uh, it actually could be less work. But it's being a role model. So if you walk the talk, you demonstrate to others, and that's when they gravitate to you. They want to be around you because the, the, you, you again, you recognize them. You, it doesn't take extra work to say congratulations to somebody. That, that's a that's a moment of your day uh, to delegate to to mentor. Um, because also, even when you're mentoring, it gives you the opportunity to to revisit some topics. That, you know, it helps you become better, you know, and again, having those conversations. And when you see yourself in the shoes of somebody else, you know, that, that it was it was you 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And if you can accelerate their learning curve by just sharing with you, don't go down that road. You're going to bang your head. Let me tell you what I did and, and let, let them make their own decision. But I just think by being a role model, it's not extra work. Um, and it's just a better way of doing things. And, and when I say doing things, you know, conducting yourself as a professional. And once you get that cadence and get it into your into your uh, daily activities, you don't think about it. You're on autopilot, and uh, it's just it's just who you are, and it reflects who you are. And again, that helps you manage, motivate, inspire, and influence people around you. So yeah, I do like that piece. That, you, that that last part I like a lot because I feel that oftentimes we think that certain things are really difficult. They're going to take a lot of time to learn, and we assume we sort of project that that investment of time will be an, a, a perpetual investment, meaning to say, I'll always have to work really hard at this, that, and the other, because it's so not natural for me. But what you talked about there, Jeff, is the idea that you know, you're going to develop some muscle memory. You're going to develop what we call unconscious competence to the point where you almost don't even have to think about it. You're interacting with people anyway. It's just how you do it. You're, you're doing a lot of work anyway, but am I doing all the work myself? Or am I investing in delegation so that I could leverage my time and give other people opportunities to grow? So it's not so much about the extra. I'm sort of answering my own question as well, sort of re basing off what you had said. But I think it's the same idea the that same I try idea. to hammer into my own 
you know, my own groups, my own clients, that you have to be willing to let go of certain things and try other things and trust the process. And eventually you will have those results. So let's, let, I want to transition out of this segment, but before I do, tell me, Jeff, please, the biggest mistake you've made, career or otherwise, that has propelled you ultimately to greater growth? Well, I think the, if I, I wouldn't belabel mistake, but what I could have done better, what I learned early in my career is we all want to bet on the horses when they finish, the, or they, they cross the finish line. And I've never been that guy. However, um, what I had to get better at is, and you just said it, trust the process. If you're going to bet on a horse, whether it's a new marketing initiative, it's a new approach, is to, you may not be totally certain or be able to see how it's all going to play out, but having faith earlier, see, let's engage people sooner and let's stay the course. And, you know, we make adjustments as we go on just like a football game. It's halftime. You make adjustments, you know, and, and, and for the second half, how things will, will, will go. I think what I learned to do was to have more faith in the process and trusting the process. Again, if we're trying to get, if we're at point A and we're trying to get to point F, it's hard. It gets a little murky between here and there. But trusting the process that we're going to get there, I had to get better at that. And by, again, as a role model, I had to I had to express that confidence, even though I didn't have pure, clear 2020 vision. Uh, but if I showed confidence, those around me did. And then it's almost like we willed it to having it happen, but it happened quicker than we than it would have if we, if, you know, oh, we may have missed out on something because we waited for the horses to finish, the, you know, across the finish line and it's too late. So that, that would be my my takeaway early in my career is, is to trust the process and, and have faith. That, that, that we're gonna we're gonna get there, even though we don't have clear vision today as to how we're going to pull it off. Awesome. So with that, we'll transition to rapid fire. My first one for you is a quote that you live by or think about often. What my father gave me when I was in my 30s. Everything in life is easy until people get involved. I think I what is it, Mike Tyson that says everyone has a plan in the ring until they get punched in the mouth? Something yeah. like that. <laughs> well, you know, it, my my father was a very successful business person, and and I didn't really appreciate it when he told it to me. But now, all these years later, yeah, you, you got to figure out the people because if you don't, you get the best plan in the world it, on paper. It's great, but it doesn't mean anything unless you have the people figured out. This is going to come out of left field. On a scale of one to ten, how weird are you? I'm well, not that weird. I'm probably two or we all have, we all have our quirks. I'd say a two or three. All right, fair enough. What are you not very good at? Dancing. Good answer. Kind of books that you read? None. I do a lot of reading online. I do snippets, whether it's YouTube, videos, uh, you know. Micro learning. Mike, that's what I do essentially. So, and I read okay. my book, of course. No, but no, in all seriousness, no, I, it's micro. It's just little snippets and picking up. And I, and I have the Kiplinger letter and the other newsletters, but it's never, I really, I rarely ever pick up a book. Uh, I, I do it from time to time, but I mean, it's the snippets. It's the micro learning that I do the most. Two so. things you do every morning to help you maximize your energy for the day. I exhibit gratitude for what I have and what's occurred in the last day or two, a little gratitude moment, and then envision how am I going to get done today and then look at what I got what's up, up against me or what I'm facing today. The opportunities, not just the, you know, not the negative, but the opportunities. And then in my mind, I'm going to go back to it, like playing it out. How am I going to get from where I am here, laying in bed, waking up to that outcome, envisioning how, what it's going to look like. And finally, a productivity tip that helps you to get more done. Exercise and eat right. Awesome. Okay. So how can people connect with you, learn more about your work, grab a copy of your book? I think the best place to go is the is the website for the book uh, from associate to ambassador .com. What's great is sign up for the newsletter. The newsletter it comes out biweekly and it's a snippet of the book. You get one page of the book, so it gives you a flavor of what to expect. One of these foundational principles and values, and um, that gives you a taste. And then you have an inner bio of myself. You know, I've served twenty one years as CEO. I've been on six different boards. Give you some of my some of my perspective where I'm coming from. 
and about the book itself. And, and again, what does it teach you know, that you didn't learn in law school or in business school? Like I said, it can apply to any industry. And there's a blog that blogs there. My podcasts are there. I will be there when they're, as each one is, is published uh, or broadcast. And uh, that's the best way to do it. And I'm on LinkedIn as well. So and awesome. do that as well. Fantastic. Well, I certainly hope everybody takes advantage of that. And uh, before I let you go, Jeff, kindly leave the leave us, excuse me, with one final life lesson. Um, it's funny. I grew up uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, the rock and roll capital of the world, and I'm here in Southern California for the last ten years. But uh, well, I I grew up initially as a child as, a, as a, an Ohio State fan. I, mean, mm -hmm. I I went over to the dark side in the late um, '80s and early '90s. I've, I've been a Michigan fan ever since. But my father gave me a book by Woody Hayes called You Win With People. It says it all. And I was a little kid when I got it. I still have that book. It's autographed by Woody Hayes. Uh, you win with people. It, it's best life lesson. I don't care what you do for a living. And it's so true. So, so in fact, you do read books after all. I Go do figure. read books. I do. Just not as often as I probably should. Anyway, it's been a pleasure, Jeff. Uh, thank you for coming on. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. Thank you for putting your insights out to the marketplace. And I certainly hope that everyone will take advantage of that and uh, and and gain from from your many years of experience. This is a great conversation. I really I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it as well. Have a fantastic day. You too, Natalia. Bye bye. Thanks so much for listening to this episode and for investing in yourself so that you can lead to succeed. Before you go, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the show. Your feedback gives the show more social proof and encourages more folks to listen. 